Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar titled Enhancing the Diversity of the NIH Funded Workforce. The purpose of today's webinar is to provide technical assistance for three interrelated funding opportunity announcements. The Building Infrastructure Leading to Diversity Initiative, or BUILD, RFA RM13016, the National Research Mentoring Network Initiative, or NRMN, and that's RFA RM13017, and the Coordination and Evaluation Center, RFA RM13015. Today's agenda includes the following sections. Please note that the agenda posted on the registration website has been revised slightly. We anticipate ending at 4.15 instead of 4.45 today. So we'll start with an introduction and webinar overview. Um, and that will be me. I'm Dr. Michael Sayre, program official at National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. Uh, then we'll move to um, a presentation on the NIH Common Funds, Enhancing the Diversity of the NIH Funded Workforce Program given by Dr. Elizabeth Wilder, Director of the Office of Strategic Coordination. And then we'll have a brief presentation on the NIMHD's role in this program by Dr. Joyce Hunter, Deputy Director, NIMHD. So um, next we'll have an overview of the BUILD initiative and timeline, and it will be presented by Dr. Toya Randolph, the program official for the BUILD initiative as well as an overview of the scientific merit review process by Dr. Carol Swartz from the Center for Scientific Review at NIH. Following the BUILD presentation, the second portion of the webinar will focus on the National Research Mentoring Network Initiative, and that will be presented by Dr. Pamela Thornton, the program official for NRMN. The last topic in this afternoon's webinar will be an overview of the Coordination and Evaluation Center initiative and the timeline for that as well, which will be presented by the program official for the CEC, Dr. Pamela Thornton. And again, there will be an overview of the review process by Dr. Carol Swartz. So before we begin, um, there's some logistics items that we need to cover. Um, please be mindful of the webinar tips presented here. Participants, will be in listening mode only and cannot ask questions verbally or via chat on this webinar. Please email any questions to the following address, B-U-I-L-D-N-R-M-N-C-E-C at NIH.gov. That's buildnrmncec at NIH.gov. Since the chat function is disabled, you may want to hide the toolbar that appears in the upper right-hand corner of your screen by clicking the first icon. On my end, this icon is orange, but it may look orange or red to you. Your questions will be de-identified and answered during the webinar, time permitting. The slides in, today, in the recording of today's webinar will be available on the Common Funds website within the next several weeks at http colon backslash backslash commonfund.nih.gov slash diversity. And again, that URL is uh, shown on the screen. If you are sending questions now to the GoToWebinar email address, please send them instead to the email address shown on your screen, buildnrmncec at nih.gov. Now at this time, Dr. Elizabeth Wilder will provide an overview of the enhancing the diversity of the NIH funded workforce program. Thanks, Mike. Um, if you want to go ahead and, and advance to the next slide for me. So what I um, want to do during my brief time with you is to discuss the challenge before us for the program as a whole, um, how this program is intended to address the challenge, um, our goals for the program, and um, why this is being implemented through the NIH Common Fund. So part of that involves a bit of an overview of what the Common Fund is and how our programs work. And so, um, just to be clear, the, the program as I'm defining it here is the three initiatives together um, with collectively how these address the, um, the goals of the program as a whole. 
So the challenge before us, I think um, everybody who's likely to be involved excuse me, in this webinar is, is very familiar with the, the challenge writ large of underrepresentation of um, various groups in the biomedical research enterprise. So that's a, a huge challenge that, that we have recognized in the NIH and across um, the scientific enterprise for many, many years now. The more immediate challenge um, before us for this particular program is um, depicted in part on this current slide. So um, the, this graph shows the funding investments by the NIH over the past many years on one particular diversity initiative um, that we refer to as diversity supplements. This, um, this initiative provides supplements to research grants to encourage the recruitment and training of um, trainees at all levels of underrepresented groups. In FY13 alone, the NIH spent more than $60 million on this program. Since 1990, the NIH, for this one program alone, has spent over a billion dollars. Next slide, Mike. Um, a, another example of NIH investments in, in trying to solve the um, underrepresentation of various groups is the NIGMS MARC program. Um, in FY13, NIGMS spent over $20 million on one component of the program, the training grant, the T34. Um, program. The next slide, Mike. Um, another program is the RISE program, again over $20 million per year. So the, the investments that the NIH has made over the past several decades are enormous. And yet, um, on a population level, we really haven't made significant progress in leading to a more diverse workforce um, within NIH-funded community. Next slide. So um, this also points out that we have um, tried investing in institutions that have a history of trying to engage um, a diverse young scientific community. Funding to HBCUs in FY12 um, exceeded $120 million. Funding to um, Hispanic serving institutions exceeded $219 million. Next slide. There are other um, programs across the NIH as well as other funding agencies that have also tried to address this problem. So um, it's not for lack of trying, it's not for lack of money. Money alone is not going to solve this problem. We have a huge conceptual challenge of trying new ways of doing things um, other than just throwing money at the problem um, to, to lead to a more diverse workforce. Next slide. We do have evidence of impact on individual trainees of these programs. Um, evaluations have been ongoing for specific activities um, that have been funded through our um, funded programs. These can have tremendous impact on individuals. So um, one of the, the opportunities that we have in front of us, um, not just to focus on the challenge, is that there has been considerable considerable body of social science research that has been going on um, to understand the underlying causes um, for the discrepancy in participation in science by various groups and to conduct um, small-scale interventions tr to try to understand um, how to uh, address this problem. Next slide. So within the, the context of the current program, um, what we're trying to focus on is the new in the following bullet. To develop new training and mentoring strategies that enhance engagement and persistence of underrepresented groups in biomedical research careers. So um, the, the, the challenge before all of us is to try to develop um, ways in your various institutions to address the problem at an institution-wide level. Um, what are the new ways of developing um, freshman laboratory curricula, for example, to help encourage and um, train young scientists? Next. Implicit within this goal um, is the support for the development and application of new approaches to training and mentoring, but also support for evaluation. A critical part of the program that we're developing 
is an assessment of what works. What works and for whom. Um, we are also very interested in supporting networking, uh, sharing ideas to enhance innovation and impact. Ultimately, if this program will have an impact at the national level, the effective approaches that are to be developed will be widely disseminated. Um, we hope to have profound impact at the institutions that are supported through the program and for the mentees that are, will ultimately be mentored. But we also want to think more broadly in the future, how are the lessons to be learned through this program going to be extrapolated? Next. So the program goals um, are to to enhance the diversity of biomedical scientists who are funded by the NIH and or otherwise contribute to the NIH funded workforce, to catalyze a systemic change in the biomedical training and research cultures to foster participation by a more diverse group. And so if you unpack that a little bit, what we mean by a systemic change is that we do hope to achieve a nationwide shift in the way science and research careers are taught. How, how are students engaged in research career pathways and how are they prepared for success? Um, we will develop and test innovative approaches to recruitment, um, to training and persistence of trainees from diverse backgrounds. And by recruitment, um, I think it's uh, important to point out we're not necessarily talking at least only about getting students into college or um, graduate education programs. It is in engaging them uh, people who perhaps would otherwise not choose a science career pathway, how do we keep the best minds engaged in science? Um, we will monitor efficacy throughout the grant period, extending the lessons learned to other NIH supported programs. And here I have involved developing an evidence base is critical. What um, we have learned anecdotally as well as from um, studies of the problem is that one barrier to developing and implementing new ways of training is a, a, a desire for data. Why change if there are no data that say that a, a different way of doing things is, will be more effective than our current way? So this program is intended to develop an evidence base that will demonstrate one way or the other where, whether new approaches have a greater impact on student persistence or not. Um, assuming that we are successful in developing more effective practices, um, we assume that the more effective ways of working will supplant less effective ways and ultimately um, have a transformative impact on the nation. Next. So um, in thinking about the, the program and trying to set it up, we as a team at the NIH have considered several questions that are relevant for this program. And um, at the top of the list is a consideration of the hallmarks of a successful biomedical research career. We all know that um, science education in itself is absolutely important. Um, there are scientific uh, principles, curricula, facts, uh, ways of doing things that are important to become a scientist. But it's, that's really not the only thing that's important. We know that successful researchers are effective networkers, they're effective collaborators, they're strategic thinkers, they write well, um, they communicate well. And so part of this program at the outset, um, very soon after awards are made, will involve a collective thinking about what the hallmarks of successful biomedical research careers really are. What do we want to train people towards? What do we want mentoring to achieve? other than um, the specific scientific concepts that the kids have to learn. We want to <laughs> consider what motivates students to enter biomedical research career paths and what th factors contribute to their sustained participation. As I alluded to earlier, there is a significant social science literature that addresses this. Um, we uh, have a great more understanding today than we did 10 or 20 years ago about the, the factors that contribute to persistence in scientific research careers. And um, there's now an opportunity through this program to apply those uh, lessons, that literature, to a real world situation to, to develop a solution. Another question that we need to consider through this program are what the factors are at an institutional, social, individual level 
that influence emerging scientists, especially those from underrepresented backgrounds, to enter, exit, or sustain a career? And how can those factors be addressed? What must happen during different training stages to ensure that trainees and participants, particularly those from underrepresented backgrounds, develop the skills, knowledge, and competencies essential to success? Um, how do institutional structures and resources facilitate successful research training and professional development activities? And I, th I think there are many ways to, to think about that particular question. There are administrative structures, there are um, ways that courses are delivered, there are different types of undergraduate teaching laboratories, there are different ways of getting students involved in research. Can we do that earlier? Can we affect more students? Can we bring more people into um, a research environment such that at an earlier stage, young scientists think of themselves as scientists? Um, how can the institutional structure and attitudes influence that? And then how can approaches be designed so that their impact continues beyond the period of NIH funding? It's important to note that the Common Fund program is a short-term program. We are trying to develop new approaches to training and mentoring over the course of the next 10 years um, with the expectation that successful approaches will be widely adopted. But at each of the awardee institutions, um, we need to be thinking from the outset of how the approaches can be designed um, to be sustained beyond the Common Fund support period. Next slide. So this program um, has an emphasis on undergraduates, and we've gotten the question of why. Um, it, it is an emphasis, not a, an exclusive emphasis, I need to point out. We do hope to have an impact on young scientists at all career stages. But this slide demonstrates um, why there is a particular emphasis on undergraduates. And part of what we have learned through the social science that has been conducted over the past many years is that College students reflect the U.S. population by and large. And moreover, science, the, the college students um, as freshmen express an interest in science um, at a similar rate um, amongst all racial and ethnic groups. So um, the, the problem's not with freshmen. At, but by the time they get to a bachelor's degree, we have an underrepresentation of scientists within our Bachelor of Science earners. And then um, when you look at entering graduate students, there's also a, a, a decrease in representation. And by the time that the PhD degree comes around, we're down to 7% of the PhD earners being from underrepresented groups. So there's a problem at the, um, within the undergraduate training period and at the transition from undergraduate to graduate school. And this is, is really why we're focusing on the undergraduates. Next. So what are the elements of this program? And in trying to develop a, a comprehensive um, solution to developing new approaches to training and mentoring, we came up with three initiatives. Next. The first is focusing on training. Um, we, we feel like training has to be a major emphasis, but again, focusing on new ways of training. We want to provide institutions of flexibility to determine the needs of novel approaches that will have the greatest impact on their student bodies. Um, we also are encouraging partnership between different types of institutions, hoping that the new approaches that are to be developed in training uh, have an impact on the primary awardee institutions as well as their partner institutions. Um, we want institution-wide commitment. And th I think this will be critical. What we hear over and over again as we talk to members of the community um, is that leadership is fundamentally important. The leaders of the institutions need to be behind the commitment to change um, or it has a difficult uh, time happening. The interinstitutional collaborations also involve a leadership um, commitment. The, all of the institutions that are engaged in these new training practices need to be on board because it will have an impact um, across department barrier, uh, boundaries um, and uh, amongst the faculty at large. Next. The next component is, of course, mentoring. Uh, I think we all understand and appreciate the requirement for effective mentoring. And we also um, appreciate the need and desire for mentoring standards and a way to determine whether mentoring is working. And mentors have 
expressed repeatedly the need for guidance and training. How can I do a better job? I want to be a great mentor. Um, maybe I'm not so great now. How do I get there? So mentor training is an important component. We want new tools and methods to be developed to enable mentoring um, to happen more widely. Um, virtual mentoring practices, any type of new tools and methods towards mentoring um, are requested. And then ultimately we hope to develop best practices for mentoring so that um, we can assess whether mentoring is, is having an important role for each of our mentees. Next. Evaluation is the final component, but it is what ties these together. Um, if you could forward Mike. The, the um, bi-directional arrows here are extremely important. The Coordination and Evaluation Center for this program will work with the awardees who are developing new training approaches and will work with awardees developing new mentoring approaches to assess in a real-time way what's working and for whom. Um, the Evaluation Center will work with the consortium as a whole to develop standard hallmarks of success, as I described a moment ago, and will develop rigorous methods to assess efficacy. Um, what are the appropriate control groups for different types of approaches that are being developed? Um, how can we work across the consortium to determine um, what's working on an ongoing basis? We don't want to wait till the end and have um, a particular hard metric that we're looking for. This needs to be an iterative process. And again, the Coordination and Evaluation Center will have responsibility for disseminating lessons learned. Next. Um, the cooperative agreements are being used for this program because we do see this as a, a, a flexible and adaptable program. Um, throughout the project period, we expect adjustments to be made in specific aims for each of the awardees as lessons are learned about what's working and what may not be working so well. And also to ensure that the awardees across the consortium are working towards the same set of um, expectations in terms of hallmarks of success so that we can compare approaches across the program. Next. So as you know, um, the FOAs for each of these initiatives have come out. I won't go through the slide. It's intended to uh, provide a synopsis of each of the three initiatives. Our training initiative is referred to as the Building Infrastructure Leading to Diversity, or BUILD initiative. Um, we have um, the Mentoring Network and the Coordination Evaluation Center. Next. So I want to give you uh, just a couple of minutes about why this program is being implemented through the NIH Common Fund. Um, and the first question is, what's the Common Fund? Next. The Common Fund um, began in 2004 as the NIH roadmap. It um, was enacted into law via the 2006 uh, Reform Act and is a separate fund within the office of the director that supports um, high priority programs for the NIH as a whole. Next. Um, thank you. The, the, we have defined specific criteria for common fund programs that I won't go into in detail. The most important is that these programs are intended to be transformative. Um, we really do think about what it will require to change the landscape of science today. And, um, and another important criterion here is the, the catalytic criterion, and I alluded to it earlier, but the goals for our programs are, um, by design, five to ten years in nature. So in this particular case, we want to design and test new approaches to training and mentoring within that period of time. Next. Um, the fact that it is a common fund program reflects that this is an NIH-wide priority. The NIH Advisory Committee to the Director um, spent a long time weighing in on this, producing recommendations about um, how the NIH can have an impact on underrepresentation of various groups. Um, they delivered recommendations in June of 2012, and in the interim, um, we as a trans NIH committee, a uh, group of people, have been working on the implementation plan. Next. So, um, how do common fund programs work? I've alluded to the fact that we are a trans NIH team, and um, that's depicted here. Uh, the Common Fund lies within the office of the director, um, but for all of the, the 30 or so programs that we support, we work closely with staff in the institutes and centers to implement the programs. And 
um, Dr. Hunter will, will describe the role of NIMHD shortly, but in this particular case, NIMHD and NHLBI are the two lead institutes for this program and have been especially involved in development and will be involved in the implementation. Next. Um, the, there is team management of the cooperative agreements. We, the, the awards are, are considered collectively by a trans NIH group of staff who participate in the development of funding plans. They have participated in the development of the funding announcements to date. Um, they work together to set priorities um, and will work closely together during the implementation phases. The um, program officers and grants management officials from the lead ICs provide oversight of each war award, um, but it's important that, to note that the final funding decisions um, and the guidance for the priorities and the goals for the program are provided by the Office of the Director. Next. This is a, dis uh, a list of the individuals who have inv been involved to date for the development of this program. Um, the group is chaired by Dr. Gary Givens, who's the director of NHLBI, um, John Ruffin, who's the director of NIMHD, working with Nate Stenson. Uh, Rod Pettigrew is in an acting position at the NIH as the acting chief officer of scientific workforce diversity, which is a new position recommended by the advisory committee to the director to help us coordinate across the NIH um, as we try to uh, diversify our workforce. And I, I just want to point out how many, how many staff from various centers, as well as the Office of the Director, are actively engaged in this program. Um, we are thinking hard about it, and I, I think that the, the goals that we are exciting and transformative, and I'm looking forward to it. Um, and I think that's my last slide. Thank you, Dr. Wilder. At this time, Dr. Joyce Hunter, the Deputy Director of the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities, will provide an overview of NIMHD's role in this new program. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sayer. Good afternoon, everyone. And I'd like to welcome you all to the webinar. From um, We're very happy to have you here. Just to give you a little bit of orientation, uh, NIMHD, the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities, is one of the 27 institutes and centers that comprises the NIH, and we're kind of highlighted highlighted in the box at the end. Uh, as Dr. May have the next slide, Mike. As um, our primary function uh, is to lead scientific research to improve minority health and to eliminate health disparities. One way in which we do this is by planning and reviewing co and coordinating, as well as evaluating. My Night Age Health Disparity Strategic Plan, which is an activity by, that is by law, in, by law coordinated by the NIMHD. In addition to that, we also conduct research in our intramural program, and we support research in the minority, on minority health and health disparities in the extramural communities. One component of our, of our mission that has always been uh, highlighted is that we promote and support the training of, diverse, of a diverse research workforce, as well as fostering innovative collaborations and partnerships. Uh, a final component is that we are very much involved in translating and disseminating information into the communities that we serve about minority health and health disparities. May I have the next slide, Mike? Um, as Dr. Wilder said earlier, uh, the NIH is the lead IC in this trans-NIH activity on enhancing diversity in the NIH workforce. What that means is that we are responsible for the programmatic, the scientific activities, and the fiscal activities in terms of oversight and management of the three initiatives, Bill, Mentoring, and CEC. So I encourage you today that when you do have questions about the BUILD program, about BUILD, um, NRMN, and CEC, that you please contact uh, the program officers that have been assigned to this activity, which are Drs. Uh, Pamela Thornton and um, Toya Randolph. 
we also are responsible, as I indicated, for the fiscal activities, and so the NIMHD grants management staff will be responsible for all of the activities that are associated with the budgets involved in these programs. But I do want to emphasize this again at the point, um, a comment that was made by Dr. Wilder. Funding decisions, as well as the funding plans and the final funding decisions, are through the office of the director. NIMHD is not providing funds for build, mentoring, or CEC initiatives out of its standard budget. This is solely an activity through the office of the director, which emphasizes the importance of this whole initiative in terms of the NIH activities and priorities. Um, and that's all I really want to say at this time, and I thank you for this opportunity. And again, if there are any questions regarding these programs, please contact Dr. Swinton and Dr. Randolph. Thank you, Dr. Hunter. Now, this concludes the first part of today's webinar. The next topic will be the BUILD initiative, which will begin promptly at 12.40 p.m. So 